a challenging year marked by the pandemic, violent protests and an assault on the US Capitol, Facebook continues to draw criticism for its part in the spread of misinformation. The social media giant has uh, long promised to play a bigger role in stopping the tide of conspiracy theories. Uh, it's now launched a campaign to help its users spot misleading posts. We're joined now by the Vice President for Northern Europe at Facebook, Steve Hatch. Morning to you. Um, just, it's interesting this, isn't it? Because obviously, Facebook faces a lot of criticism because you, you make billions of pounds and then you, at this stage, uh, haven't found a way uh, of uh, protecting the public and, as many say, democracy itself from uh, misinformation. And this new campaign uh, appears to be putting a great deal of burden on your users. Uh, is that fair? Well, it would be fair if it was the only thing we're doing, but it, but it's not. And in fact, uh, we've been investing very heavily in systems, investing billions of pounds, and we now have over 35,000 people working on safety and integrity. And for years, working out how to best tackle misinformation. And for the last year, we've been particularly laser focused on how we can focus on COVID related misinformation. And that means that we've we detected and taken down 15 million pieces of harmful content. We fact checked and labeled over 165 million pieces of misinformation. And really importantly, countering misinformation with the right information. So we've directed over 10 million uh, visits to the NHS's website. And today's campaign is, is another tranche in that. It's another arsenal in this, in this battle. So together with full fact to create three simple steps for people to think about when they're consuming any content online, whether that's Facebook or anywhere else. And that's really just to perhaps pause sometimes and just think, well, okay, there are three things I can do around this. I can check the source. I can check how this information makes me feel. And I can check the context of this. Okay. Can I just step in? Because, um, I know that Facebook, Facebook thinks of itself as a, as a platform rather than a publisher, but effectively you are a publisher. You're publishing all of this content for people to consume. And in the case of publishers, the publisher does all of that. It checks all of that and it is regulated for that. To rely on the user to do that. I mean, I'll give you an example. If you receive abuse on a social media platform, you don't need to spend a couple of minutes thinking, how does this make me feel? You feel utterly awful. Now, why isn't Facebook doing more to stamp out abuse on its social media platforms. Well, that's exactly what we're doing. And in, in terms of looking for regulation, you know, we are we, we welcome new rules and controls, and that's going through government at the moment. But we haven't waited for those things. We've made these big investments. In fact, our investments in safety and integrity are bigger now than the total revenue of the company when it first IPO. So we really hear this really clearly. And of course, when anyone receives uh, any kind of form of abuse, whether it's in the real world or online, yeah, it, it's really damaging, it's really harmful. So that's why we have teams of experts. Last October, last October, The Guardian reported on a landmark survey which revealed shocking accounts of escalating online violence against girls and women across more than 20 countries. Explicit messages, pornographic photographs, cyber stalking and other forms of abuse. And the attacks were most common on Facebook, followed by Instagram and WhatsApp, your platforms. That's just a couple of months ago and those attacks are escalating. You are simply not doing enough. Well, I believe we're doing everything we can and we'll continue to think in innovative ways of doing it. Of course, we have the largest platform, so that comes with a really big responsibility. A huge so responsibility the area... to these people who are experiencing abuse. A number of Premier League footballers, this is just last month, including Manchester United's Marcus Rashford, um, have received abusive online messages. Now, the Football Association has called for action from the government and says, the government says, social media companies could face large fines, potentially amounting to billions, if you don't tackle abuse. Now, you say you're doing everything you can. Why are black footballers in particular, in particular still receiving this level of hate? I get anybody receiving hate is an awful experience. And I want to be really clear. It's not something we want on our platforms. It's not the people that use our platforms want as well. 
So we're working directly with the Premier League and the other football organisations to see what more can we do. OK, so I'll tell you something that can be system. done. Why, well, why, I've, I've, when I've, you go into the direct messages, for instance, on Instagram, why is it a sewer? Why are people allowed to send hateful, racist, abusive messages which affect people's state of mind? Why are they allowed to do that? If you are doing everything you can, if you are doing everything you can, then it suggests you can't do anything more. But you well, can certainly well, go I, clear, into the direct uh, messages. Yeah, I think there's always more them. that there's always more that we that we can do. We're so you're not doing everything ways. you can then. So, for example, you know, we, we're now people, anyone to control who actually can send them direct messages. Now, if you're a public figure, um, we know that that comes with particular challenges because you might actually want to hear directly from the people that you're communicating with on Facebook or Nobody Instagram wants or, racist or abuse other. directly uh, in their, di uh, in their direct absolutely. messages. Absolutely. So that's why the, uh, the no next step... No-one wants sexual at... abuse directly in their direct messages. Why no, are you leaving why... it to the user to put in the filters? Why aren't you taking action as any responsible publisher would? We are taking deep levels of action, lots of investment. And actually, if you look at the areas where we've been working to progress our takedowns of proactive, takedowns of harmful content, many cases that is 90, 95%. So for example, on hate speech, for example, we're now at 95% proactively taking down that content. We certainly don't want it. We don't want people to have a bad experience. We work with experts that work here at Facebook and experts in, in other areas that help us construct the right policies and then make sure we're producing the system changes that need to take place. And today, now, these, now, even more people will receive those, those messages in the direct message. I mean, I just don't understand why you're not acting as a responsible publisher in either deleting those messages before they're even sent or in getting rid of those accounts. Well, we certainly if people are continuing to, to violate accounts and to abuse people, we take them down. In fact, you know, again, millions of accounts are taken down for people that aren't using the right rules. And it's quite often seen the case that, uh, that anything goes, and it really doesn't. We have very strict the community is, standards and we work that, really hard to I I enforce them. And now, the just thing that clear, people really know, struggle to understand, that Steve, that, is that we, all, you know, Sorry, most people, you know, use it as a sort of layman. We don't understand the technology behind it, and nor should we really need to know about it. It's for you to, to, to do it. But the thing is, you know, you, and people have said this for years, you put one thing in, you put one search in, and you get dozens of adverts for the rest of time about this one, you look up for a pet, pet thing and it comes up forever. But, you know, so you know that you have got the tools in there to recognise words that are used. And then, therefore, you can follow those words and then produce more adverts. The problem is that people say, well, hang on, there are obvious racist words, there are obvious abuse words. Why can't you use the same tools? And I know this sounds like a layman's question, but I think that's how people think. If no, you can do I... it to make money from adverts, why can't you use exactly the same or something similar to wheedle out words that you don't want on there? It just yeah, doesn't make sense to people in the, in the public. It just, you know, you're just there to make profit. And as many say, actually, in the end, you allow so much misinformation to go out there. It actually damages democracy. It damages people's, the way people vote, the way people think, the way people view the world. Well, we want to make sure that our tools are being used for, for, for good. Yeah, and we've seen that happen kind of again and again across the last few months when it comes to the pandemic. You know, we've heard what a crucial point we are in the pandemic right now, how getting the right information in a very real sense can make a real difference to us being able to you know, get back to some form of normality. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we're taking down the bad content, you know, and we have made real progress. Except in, in Australia, you took down all news, news feeds. and then actually uh, 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 ill-informed sort of fake news sites were still able to get through. So that sort of blunt, blunt tool didn't work, did it, in Australia? Well, when it came to Australia, the, the reason for that and for people that haven't been following it, I'm sure it did feel quite abrupt, but actually it was a form of legislation that um, simply couldn't work. We couldn't adhere to that legislation. So at that point, we didn't have any choice Making other you than to pay for journalism on your site. We were able to then uh, get the negotiating table, and it's great that, that, that Facebook is now back up for Australian users. Now, in the UK, we've got a very different approach to, to news, where we have a separate section uh, called Facebook uh, Facebook News in the tab that enables publishers to be paid for that content. 
and also uh, the Facebook Community News Project, which uh, is now in its third year, enabling uh, particularly local journalism to be sustained. Because we know just quite, I think we all know quite how important, of course, having quality journalism. It's been a deeply challenged business model for many reasons, not least of all because we're reading less papers than we have. So of course it forms an important part. And we want to play a part in helping to sustain the future of journalism yeah. in the same way well, I think that we that want to help play a part to stay in, 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 a, in, in a healthy, yeah. connected society okay. where communities can thrive. Uh, we the, know that means... The Culture got to Secretary and Oliver Dowden has told you uh, your decision to pull the plug on those news feeds in Australia was a nuclear option that must not be repeated in the UK. I think a lot of people will think, well, if it affects you and you can pull uh, the news feeds in reaction to what the Australian government was doing in terms of its legislation, you certainly have the power to be able to pull all the abuse before it gets directly to its targets. Um, Steve Hatch, uh, Facebook Vice President for well, Northern Europe. We're going to continue to work really hard on that. And thanks for the time today. And I hope people can benefit from the campaign that's launching today.